Hi everyone. It is now 5.39 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, March 12th, in the supposed year of 2017. And I just realized a little while ago that it was uh, Daylight Savings. So we have officially sprung forward. If not, I would be doing this recording at 4.39 a.m., which by some people's standards is total insanity. And you may be right. Today I'm going to continue on circumstantial worldviews. This will be part 4b. Because as I said in 4a, this subject, because it has to do with eschatology and thus history, because of my eschatology, it's not as simple and clear-cut as I'm sure a lot of us wish that it was. Unfortunately, history itself, or at least the history that we have, is it's so complex in its nuances because it consists of the actions of many various people. And you know, most of the history that I'm going to be talking about, you have to understand, is the history of, or <laughs> centered around, the Mediterranean. And even that itself I find amazing because the even the Mediterranean's sea, its name, means the middle sea. So this is sort of everything happening around Middle Earth, if you will, and not Tolkien's Middle Earth which was a fantasy. This is the real Middle Earth, and hopefully uh, enough history that has been handed down to us, hopefully enough of that, we are able to distill down into a picture that makes it comprehensible. So the thing with history is there's so many people in so many places doing so many things that you can dig into history as I have and come out of it saying to yourself it is so vast who can make heads or tails of it all and then that brings me to the eschatology that I hold, that I know a number of you either currently hold or are being convinced of, and that is the historicist view of eschatology. When I say historicist view, if you were to do uh, an information search to find a definition of the biblical historicist view of eschatology, you're going to find a definition that essentially will say that the historicist view of eschatology, eschatology being a prophecy of the end times, end time prophecy or the things of the end, and we know it's been the end times since the advent of our Messiah, Yehoshua, Jesus it's been the end times since he came. And if people were to say, well, that's, that's kind of, you know, amazing that it's been the end times for, I would say, at least 16 to 1700 years. And some people who really believe that we're in the 21st century would say 2000 years. But either way, 
That's a long time to be in the last days. And it is. It is the last age before the coming kingdom of Yahweh the Father, which will be presided over and ushered in by Yehoshua, known as Jesus in most of our English translations, his only begotten Son, our Messiah, and our Lamb, our King and High Priest. And he did not leave us with no roadmap, picture of what times would be from the first century to now. If you have currently a futurist or a preterist view of eschatology, you have to then believe that our Messiah, our King, who loved us so much that he gave up his life for us, he lowered himself to a servant, and him who knew no sin became sin for us, so that we could become the righteousness of God. You have to believe that he left his church for centuries upon centuries with no clear roadmap of how to navigate their times and understand why the times were going the way they were going. That's what you have to concede if you're either a futurist or a preterist. <clears throat> you see, that's why I believe futurism and preterism, the two great pretenders to the throne of eschatology, are so dangerous. Because the futurist says that Antichrist has yet to appear and tribulation has yet to occur. And so thus the history that has transpired since the first century is tertiary in importance and we can just easily forget the past and all of the damage um, and violence that the kingdom of God has suffered in the last couple of millennia. We can basically push that aside, make it secondary or tertiary, because we are expecting all of this to happen ahead of us. And so, thus, we forget and don't even consider the essentially important role that the Roman Catholic Church centered at the Vatican and her agents specifically Jesuits, Knights of Malta, uh, Dominicans, Opus Deis, and now the CIA and other alphabet agencies in this country and this country, the United States itself, is playing in world affairs. If you believe in futurism, you are blind to these things. Some people who believe in futurism have at least enough sense to see the dark history that Rome and her counter-reformation, the Jesuits, have played. People like Alan Lamont and Eric John Phelps, and Eric John Phelps I'm not even classifying with Alan Lamont, because Eric John Phelps preaches a gospel of bigotry and hate. Um, so, even if you have enough vision to see 
the very substantial role that the Vatican's agents have played the last few centuries or so, you're still not entirely understanding the role of the Papal Roman Empire in world history and now the role of the American Empire in the world today, current events and future events, and what is to transpire. You don't know, and you cannot lead anyone in the way of the truth. If, on the other hand, you're a preterist, believing that either all of Revelation was fulfilled in the first century in the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, that would be the full preterist, or that most of it was fulfilled, except the last couple of chapters that would make you a partial preterist. Most preterists today, like Hank Hanegraaff, James White, R.C. Sproul, to name a few, most partial preterists believe that the last couple of chapters are either yet to be fulfilled or had been slowly fulfilled uh, over the last couple of millennia. They essentially, by believing preterism, they provide a great deal of weight and authenticity to all of the perverse actions performed by those who they have named apostolic fathers, church fathers. They give weight and credence to councils like Nicaea and Constantinople. They look at the Catholic Church as just Christianity gone a bit awry where if you're a historicist and understand the symbolism in Revelation from a long-term historicist point of view, you understand that Roman Catholicism and the papacy itself is Mystery Babylon, Antichrist, the Little Horn, the Man of Sin, the Son of Perdition, you name it. Those who hold the historicist interpretation of Revelation, and they are not just Seventh-day Adventists, though how grateful I am that the Adventists have kept this torch for well over a century now, even though their general counsel has strayed away from keeping these very important aspects of the historicist view of prophecy, we still owe that church a great debt of gratitude, not only because they have faithfully held to the historicist view of Revelation, but also because they have made it a central aspect of their teaching that in no way did the Sabbath ever get changed in the New Testament, and you cannot prove it ever did. But also, you I wish I could remind people of this continually. The new covenant that Yehoshua Jesus made in his blood. You remember when he's having the Last Supper, he passes around the cup. This is the new covenant made in my blood. That new covenant you can reference in Jeremiah 31, 33. When Yahweh says, this is the new covenant that I will make with the house of Judah and the house of Israel, that I will put my commandments not away, no, he says, I will put my commandments in their hearts. I'll write it on their inward parts. So it wasn't about the law being demolished. Jesus said, I did not come to destroy the law. I came to fulfill it. so we can understand all the instructions 
of Yahweh through all of the grace and truth that we have received from Yehoshua, his only begotten son and anointed one. So, I very much appreciate what the Adventists have done in those, in those ways. But this doctrine of historicism, uh, also the doctrine of Sabbath keeping, it's not an Adventist doctrine. They simply have been one of the few remnants that have held on to these things up until what looks like recently. And there's, there's much trouble that is brewing and has been for some time in uh, the Adventist General Council, if you want to look into that. Because, as I said, we owe, I think, great thanks to Yahweh the Father in our Lord, Yehoshua the Anointed, for keeping the flame of historicist eschatology alive. Now, I don't agree with every aspect of their eschatology. Uh, I've told you before that I, I don't agree with the doctrine of 1844. I know why I know why they have it. I know why they hold to it, and I know that they use scripture to to prove this doctrine, although it is my belief that the scriptures used to prove their their doctrine of, of 1844, essentially it's the doctrine of um, investigative judgment, um, I, I disagree with them on that. And uh, I disagree with them on a few other uh, essentials. Of course, they they would believe me to be wrong when I say that salvation <clears throat> is entirely a work of Yahweh the Father and has nothing to do with man. Um, and that when he saves you and you're placed into the hand of Yehoshua, Jesus, our Messiah, he can't lose you and he will raise you up in the last day. Their views in general concerning these things are different than my views. I would suppose, and we all hate labels, we do, but I would suppose you could say that they're more Armenian and I'm more Calvinist when it comes to soteriology or the doctrine of salvation. Um, but I very much agree with them when it comes to um, this idea of eternal conscious torment and flame. I, I don't agree with that. I don't see it in the Bible at all. When you start understanding how many different words that the King James Bible and other Bible translators have used for hell, it, it's so wrong, this view that we have of this eternal conscious torment and flame. Uh, so we're right on with that. Um, I believe we also agree on the doctrine of uh, what people would call soul sleep. When man dies, they man you go into the ground. If you're listening to me right now, the day that you die, which will be sometime ahead of today, you will go into the ground if you're buried or whatever they do with your remains. You will, as far as your conscience goes, you will know nothing until the general resurrection of the saints. That's the beauty of the resurrection. If when the saints die, they go up and happy-go-lucky party it up in heaven, the resurrection has got a little less impact. The Jews 
and Israelites of the first century would have known nothing of this go to heaven kind of doctrine. They would have very much understood, though, a resurrection. Because they knew when you died, you died. Go check the writings of Solomon. They understood that. The way I believe it works, except in various um, in, in various cases where there are exceptions made, and we know there are exceptions made in Enoch, in Elijah, um, and there may be more than we even know, to be honest with you. There may be a number of people, Moses even, there may be a number of people that Yahweh chose to translate into their, I guess I should say, sort of their um, immortal resurrection state to a degree. I don't know if it's complete without um, Christ's full resurrection of the body. I'm, I'm still not completely sure of that, but <clears throat> there could be a lot of exceptions made. And it depends on what he decides, because he's Yahweh. He will be and do what he will be and do. And he can do these things because he's Yahweh. And he can do these things without going against his character. It's just like he is allowed to love whoever he's allowed to love. He's Yahweh. He who exists. Or he who secures breath. And that would be deriving the meaning of his name from the ancient Hebrew, <clears throat> not what we call Hebrew today, which is not what we call Hebrew today. Is it's Aramaic, Syriac script. It's not. It's not really Hebrew. But so I agree with with some of those things that 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 they believe, and uh, I I think it's foolish, foolhardy, for any one of us to just believe that the brand of Christianity that we were raised with is the right way and the orthodox way and everybody else is crazy or a cult or whatever else you've been told about them before you look into them. I have a friend who I met through through these videos and we talk from time to time um, and if he's listening I I got a new phone and uh, I was I was told I'd be able to keep the my old phone number and uh, when I got the phone then I found out I couldn't so I haven't been able to program my contacts in I will program you in and I'll send you a message with my new number so I'm I hope you don't think that I, I like brushed you off or something but um, I have a friend who's Jehovah's Witness and we have a an open dialogue about what the Jehovah's Witness believe and you know they have a number of doctrines that are far more biblical and orthodox than evangelical Christianity as do Adventists so it should make you pause and think about just assuming that your brand of Christianity is right if you go by the Bible and the Bible alone and you rely on the Holy Spirit of God, <clears throat> excuse me, the Spirit of Christ to lead you and guide you into all truth, then you are not far from the kingdom of heaven. You are on the right track. But if you just go by a denomination or what people have told you, the traditions of men, you got to get away from that and get back to the truth. So, ah, that was my introduction into what we're talking about today. And I do want to sincerely thank those of you who have sent me messages and emails over uh, the last few months and more encouraging me. Because as I've said, the, the reason I do this it is not because I think much of myself. I do this because nobody out there was representing 
people who I believe have the kind of sincere questions and perhaps abstract and original thoughts that I and many of my listeners have. So I'm just doing these things to try to to help give you a voice too. Uh, I don't want you, any of you, to adopt some doctrine of mine. I I try not to. I I try not to have or pigeonhole myself into any doctrine that I don't know that I know that I know is supported biblically. We're we're all, all of us who are in Christ. We are all being sanctified. We are all being conformed to his image. So we're all being translated from death into life. We're on a journey. And we're going to learn more and more truth as we go. That is my sincere hope for all of you out there and for myself. And I also want to thank all of you who have taken the time to pray for me. Many of you know that both my wife and myself suffer from some relatively severe health problems, both of them being somewhat crippling in their own ways. Um, Starting this weekend, I decided that I'm quitting smoking. And I did okay yesterday. I cut down a lot. And uh, today, I am going to be taking a break from daily family life for a couple of days because my wife and I both agree that this might help uh, relieve some of the stress of day-to-day life so that I can focus on getting over that hump and getting that first 24 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours, you know, one hour at a time. So all of you who are listening to me, um, if you'd pray for me concerning that, I I just want to glorify um, my God and my Master in my body, uh, as well as in my heart, my mind, my actions, And that's, as far as I'm concerned, that is, it's key. You know, when we think of uh, the people we look up to, and it's okay to look up to people, you know, Paul said, imitate me as I imitate the Messiah. So it's okay. When we think of looking up to people, we don't typically think of looking up to somebody with a lit cigarette plugged into their mouth, right? I mean, let's be honest. We usually don't. Um, <clears throat> I'm not. I'm not condemning. I'm not condemning the people who smoke cigarettes because all of us are dealing with problems in our flesh. Um, Paul himself said that he understood that although he had a new nature and had been given new desires in his heart, that sin dwelled in his flesh. And so it was a constant struggle against sin. Um, Up until recently, and I want to say recently as in the last, within the last year, I struggled with pornography terribly badly. Uh, It was horrible. I was throughout my life from a young age exposed to pornography and Uh, things that I never should have seen and then experienced, and it became a cancer in my life that consumed me. I was, for so many years, so perverse in the way that I thought, that I looked at the opposite sex, that I looked at myself, the way that I treated my body, other people's bodies, the way that I viewed the intimacy of sex was all wrong. It was all twisted, turned upside down. And I have been relieved 
of that perversion so much. Uh, and it didn't happen overnight. So I'm fully confident that I will be relieved of the burden upon my body of cigarette smoking. And then after that, I'd like to cut down coffee. And I'm also on a, a type of uh, um, time-released uh, pain meds, which helps with the cancer. But uh, I, I would really like to not be on that either. With my history of, of um, heroin addiction, you know, I, I just... I, I don't I honestly I don't I'm not in love with the idea that I need to cope with the pain of the cancer with that and I would at least like to try to go without it for a while and see if the pain from the cancer spots is is unbearable or not I mean, I know that the pain is is pretty intense and it phases in and out even using uh, this painkiller. But I want to be for sure. I want to be for sure. I want to be sure that it's not just making the cancer worse. So... I'm starting with the cigarettes, and then I hope not long after that um, I'll be able to cut down the pain medication for the cancer, and um, well, I think that the the coffee just accompanies those things. Really, it's just seems like it does, you know. Like people who uh, drink alcohol, and they you know they smoke a lot more when they drink alcohol. I don't drink alcohol anymore. I stopped doing that quite some time ago. But uh, I'm a man, uh, just like all of you, and uh, I have problems just like everybody else. But here they are, and uh, I don't have the first problem with bearing them and asking for people to remember me when you pray because the prayer of a righteous man or woman goes a long way with the Father. So, anyways, all right. On the screen, I have an image. It's a map of the area surrounding the Mediterranean. On the right, in purple, is about the extent of the Byzantine Empire at its, I guess, at its uh, a zenith, its zenith years. And in the red, to the left, <clears throat> is uh, the height of the Western, or what we think of as the Roman Empire. You see, Constantine a Roman emperor in the 4th century, he moved the capital to a city in the east and named this city Constantinople. Um, the city had existed far before he moved his capital there, um, but him being the emperor, he had the right to change it. This actually, this location right here was was brilliant, and I, I think for all of Constantine's faults, and the fact that Constantine claimed that he had that vision, claimed Christianity, which I don't, I don't believe those claims of his. I know he got baptized on his deathbed, and I'm glad he at least did that. I am, and I do hope sincerely to see Constantine and the kingdom to come. I very much do. 
But, I mean, for all of the hype behind Constantine and his life and his rise to power, um, I think he was very, very brilliant in his maneuvers, things that he did. And moving the capital to Constantinople, here between um, the Black Sea and the small inlet sea, the Bosphorus area, um, I think was a brilliant move because it was one of the most well-guarded cities. And it essentially took the invention of the long-range, massive, massive cannons um, that the Ottomans, the Turks, uh, brought in and pounded Constantinople with. They literally invented this long-range cannon. That was the only way they were able to defeat the city because it was so well protected. Unlike Rome, Rome, which had been sacked again and again and again. So he finally figured that, you know, th this is not the best location. And when he did that, <clears throat> Rome still remained as uh, the western seat of the empire. There was the eastern seat and the western seat. Now as time went by and things got pretty turbulent. Uh, they were turbulent in the time of Constantine. Civil wars, generals fighting with generals, pretenders to the throne and all of that, you know. Well, that didn't necessarily stop. Uh, Constantine brought some relative peace to the empire through a lot of pragmatism, a lot of compromise. And that's one thing that we're going to have to view and understand about history is how detrimental the compromises of Constantine and those who came after him were to the church or our understanding of the church and how it eventually gave rise to that beast that comes up out of the abyss, which is what we see happening in the 2nd, 3rd, 4th centuries, and then goes to perdition, which happened in time afterward. So there remained, from post-Constantine times onward, two distinct legs of the Roman Empire, the eastern leg being the Byzantine Empire, and the western leg, the Roman Empire, which became the Holy Roman Empire, a confederation. So, if you remember, what I read from Daniel 2 last time, the statue, when he gets down to the legs, it's two legs of iron. And Rome is typified by iron. Two legs. Byzantium, Holy Roman Empire. Those two legs give way to two feet with ten toes of iron and clay because just like iron and clay, when mixed together, is partly strong, partly weak, so, too, these empires and confederations that were formed were partly strong and partly weak. And we're going to go into a very good key example of how they were partly strong and partly weak. So each vision that were given of these empires and world history is teaching us something distinct and unique about the empires of the world and the history of the world. And again, these things are not answering to every event that has happened worldwide. In fact, there was a very strong, thriving Eastern Church that many people forget about, 
Eastern Church in Parthia, in India, China, Armenia. Christ did not forget about them. But you see, everything that led up to where we are today was centralized around the Mediterranean, the Middle Sea. History is being borne out just as it was outlined in Revelation and in Daniel and in excerpts throughout the prophets and the apostles. History is being borne out and is going to, in a sense, a funnel. It will come to a head. And eventually, thank Yahweh, our Savior will come and bring the kingdom of Yahweh here to this earth. And his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. So, I'm very thankful for that. So what we're going to do, in that we consider that as Daniel saw that vision that King Nebuchadnezzar had in his dream of the statue with two legs of iron and then two feet of iron and clay with the ten toes of iron and clay, that has played out historically in these empires. But we can't just take certain isolated factors and build a worldview or a doctrine from those, we're going to have to look at a lot of material that is specifically eschatological and decide if the weight of the material speaks to and supports a historicist view of Bible prophecy or not. So with that in mind, Let's just talk a little bit about, since we left off last time, uh, by reading Daniel 2, Daniel 7, and then part of Revelation 12 and the Red Dragon. Let's talk a little bit about what we see in Revelation 12 and 13, these beasts, because I believe that last time, we saw plenty of material to establish that beasts are kingdoms, that heads are often divisions of a kingdom, as is horns. Horns can be subdivisions, separate parts that make up a whole. We saw this with the leopard with four heads. We saw this in the ram with two horns, one bigger than the other. We saw this in the fourth beast of Daniel 7 with ten horns and a little horn that sprang up among them. And we're going to talk about him. We saw that with the he-goat of Daniel 8 with one notable horn that gave way and four horns sprang up instead. That would be the four generals of Alexander, Lysimachus, Ptolemy, Seleucid, Cassander. It's a well-established fact. We have very concrete proof of what beasts are and what heads and horns can symbolize. So knowing that, we can read in Revelation 12, 13, and probably go on to Revelation 17. Look at the beasts that are talked about in here uh, in Revelation and see what we can determine from them. So, here we go, off to Revelation. Now, I don't want to look at these things through the same eyes that many historicists have looked at them through. So, oftentimes, when I talk about these different beasts, it's real possible that I'm going to get into the specifics of them 
to determine what we can only from the text, not historicist tradition thus far, because I believe that even historicist tradition has been, to some extent, infiltrated and perverted. So, last time we looked at Revelation 12, and we saw the vision that John had. He said, a great sign appeared in heaven. And I'm reading from the Tree of Life version. It's a, it's a very interesting translation of the Bible, and it gives us a lot of terms that are more rooted in some Tanakh terminology, and I like that because uh, doing that creates a consistency of terms between the Tanakh, or what most people call the Old Testament, and the New Testament. There needs to be that consistency of terms, and I believe that this idea that the original manuscripts were in Greek, it has for many, 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 many centuries caused this disconnect. It's why we still think in Hellenistic terms. We got to get that out of our heads. So anyways, Tree of Life version. Now, he starts out with the woman who's pregnant with the child. And what I want to go to is when he says in Revelation 12, 3, another sign appeared in heaven, a great fiery red dragon that had seven heads and ten horns, and seven royal crowns on its heads. And then it goes on to talk about his tail sweeping a third of the stars in heaven, cast them to the earth. He, he fought, Michael fought. Okay, and then after that, okay, the red dragon is thrown down to earth later on. And... In that, there is a cry of woe. And in 1212, when the dragon is cast to the earth and his angels, it says, Rejoice, O heavens, you who dwell in them. Because he's been cast out of heaven, he can no longer accuse the saints. Woe to the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you with great rage, knowing that his time is short. Keep that in mind when you hear a lot of these futurists who keep talking about the devil and his uh, angels are doing this, that, and the other because they're trying to win this great battle. No, the Bible says that the devil knows his time is short. And then 12.13, when he saw that he had been thrown to earth, he stalked the woman who had given birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of the great eagle that she might fly away from the present of the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she is taken care of for a time, times, and half a time. And from out of his mouth the serpent spewed water like a river after the woman in order to sweep her away with a flood. The flood we can interpret from Daniel 9, armies. But the earth came to the aid of the woman. Now remember, the earth, that's important, the earth came to the aid of the woman. The earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had spewed from its mouth. So the dragon became enraged at the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her offspring, those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Yeshua. And he stood on the shore of the sea. Now you'll notice that the dragon, described in Revelation 12, is oftentimes equated with the fourth beast that we see in Daniel chapter 7. But remember, 
The fourth beast that we saw in Daniel chapter 7 was described as a beast diverse from all the beasts that came before it. It was said to have ten horns, but not seven heads, ten horns. It had teeth of iron, and it had nails of brass, and it was a massively powerful, destructive beast. And as he watched this beast, he saw that a small horn sprang up from among the ten. And when he sprang up, three of the ten were plucked up by their roots. Now, it said that the beast that he saw remained until the Ancient of Days came. He also said that the little horn made war on the saints until the Ancient of Days came. The saints of the Most High were to take away his kingdom and consume it until the end. That's what we see from Daniel 7. We're not seeing the same exact beast, but it's close, it's similar, and we're going to see the similarities in the next chapter. And we're going to start understanding why there are certain similarities and why there aren't. And it's because just like in Daniel, from chapter 2 to chapter 7, we see two different kinds of images overlaid upon one another so that we can understand different aspects of these kingdoms of the earth until the end. In the same way in Revelation, we're given further information that help us understand the aspects of these worldly kingdoms until the end. And now in Revelation 12, the devil is personified as this great fiery red dragon with seven heads and ten horns. On his heads are ten crowns. Now, what's brilliant about this is not only are we seeing a picture of the completeness of all of the kingdoms of the earth that Satan has presided over in the seven heads and the ten horns. But we're also seeing a further step forward from the picture that was left off <clears throat> in Daniel chapter 7. Now, some have expounded upon this fiery red dragon that we see in 12, who we know is the devil. But we also know that there's more to this than just the devil. The beast that personified the pagan Roman Empire was the dragon. And in fact, the dragon is associated with Rome again and again throughout the centuries. So we see this great red dragon in Revelation 12. And you can see it as not only the devil and the fullness of his worldly empires, but also understand that as Rome. The seven heads with the seven crowns, I've heard it said, and it, it's pretty sensible that that represents seven types of ruling authorities that the pagan Roman Empire had in its lifespan before it became something different because it did not stay the pagan Roman Empire. That empire changed into a different kind of empire. Still, the Roman Empire 
but not the papal Caesar Roman Empire. The Ten Horns I believe the Ten Horns are not only those ten barbarian tribes that spring up and cause a lot of problems to the pagan Roman Empire and ultimately spell a lot of its demise, at least took away a lot of its strength to where it had to become a federation. But they're also going to represent the division of that federation from that early time in AD history until even the time that we live in. If you pay attention to a number of futurists, they'll show you um, a map of the world and show you how the world has been subdivided into ten regions. And in fact, I believe that to be true and the people who have divided it into that ten regions is Rome. Those regions are presided over by the powers at the Vatican. So those ten subdivisions still exist. Now we're going to have to see this same beast as the red dragon we see in 12. We're going to have to see that again in 17 and 18. And because we see it these two times in two very different ways at two very different times in history, I am of the mind that the ten horns not only represent those ten kingdoms which became a federation um, known as in later times the Holy Roman Empire, which is personified in a greater way in the next beast that we'll see in Revelation 13. But also, I think, I think in a way, those ten horns are as complete, uh, I, I guess a complete uh, symbol as the seven heads. In 17 and 18, the angel, Christ's angel, explains the mystery of the woman and the beast with the heads and the horns, and we're going to better understand it. But the reason that I'm talking about these things in a way that is not all that concrete is because a lot of the interpretations that I've heard thus far from historicists, I don't believe that they are absolutely right on. I believe that they have certain grains of truth to them, but I'm not going to lock us in to one thing because I think we need to keep certain things kind of open. Okay, so now we're going to move on to 13. And John starts in Revelation 13, 1. Then I saw a beast rising out of the sea that had ten horns and seven heads. On his horns were ten royal crowns. Upon his heads were slanderous names. Now the beast that I saw was like a leopard, his feet like a lion's, and his mouth like a bear's. And the dragon gave him his power and his throne 
and great authority. One of his heads seemed to have been slain, but the fatal wound was healed. The whole earth was amazed and followed the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, because he had given authority to the beast. They also worshipped the beast, chanting, Who is like the beast, and who can make war against him? The beast was given a mouth, uttering great boasts and blasphemies. It was given authority to act for forty-two months. Then he opened his mouth with blasphemies against God to slander his name and his tabernacle, that is, those dwelling in heaven. He was also permitted to make war against the Kedoshim, which is the saints, and overcome them. And he was given authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation. All who dwell on the earth shall worship him. Everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is meant for captivity, to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be killed by the sword, by the sword he must be killed. Here is the perseverance and faith of the Kedeshim. So now herein we're going to focus on this beast. Revelation 13, 1 through 10. Because this beast is a continuation of the fourth beast we saw from Daniel 7. Now first off, I challenge any futurist out there to make anything but kingdoms of the beasts seen in Daniel 7. I find it amazing that futurists can admit that the different metals in the statue are the different kingdoms. They can sometimes admit that those four beasts are just a deeper, more expanded look at those four kingdoms from the statue. But somehow they are unable to just see how that fourth beast never went away. When they talk about eschatology in, in their view, they always have to say they believe Antichrist will come forth out of a revived Roman Empire. Well, to say that assumes that the Roman Empire was ever gone. Where do you get that? Where do you see that? Do you not understand from Daniel 7 that that fourth beast and little horn make war on the saints until the Ancient of Days comes? You can't revive the Roman Empire. It's still in existence and always has been. And we find out more about it here in Revelation 13. If you stay with the consistency of interpretation, you will not lose the plot. But when you break the consistency of these interpretive symbols, when you break that consistency, you lose the plot. And there's no need to do that. It's simple. It's simple in the way that we keep seeing aspects of that last great kingdom that will rule the earth. But it's also very complex because we see different 
nuances of not only that final kingdom, but we also see nuances of the one who is behind it all, being the devil, typified and personified in the pagan Roman Empire, and we'll see him again personified in all the empires of the world from the time just after the flood until Yehoshua comes to bring in God's kingdom. If you understand that, according to history, the Roman Empire's never gone anywhere. You can read this, Revelation 13, 1 through 10, and understand what's going on here. So, just like Daniel, John sees from the vantage point of the seashore a beast rising up out of the sea, just like Daniel saw. The sea, many waters, they're interpreted. We'll see it later on in Revelation. This is many peoples, tribes, nations, languages, tongues. That is absolutely precisely what we see with the Roman Empire. That's what this beast rises up from, is this great sea of peoples. The Roman Empire sat upon so many different peoples, nations, languages, and tongues. Now this beast that John sees that comes up out of the sea, it also has seven heads and ten horns, but the crowns are not on the heads, like in 12. The crowns are on the horns. We see what was called the Holy Roman Empire. That is what it became. After the time that powers were transferred, the power of Pontifus Maximus, the Caesar powers, were transferred to the Bishop of Rome. And now the mythology of it goes that, and this is what's accepted as standard, it goes that in 768 that Pope Leo III crowned Charles Martel, also known as Charlemagne, who was a Frank, as the king or emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. Now struggles between the kings, because it wasn't always a Frankish king. It changed. It was often different kings of different horns, or subdivisions of the empire who would be the Holy Roman Emperor and oftentimes it depended on what the Pope said and sometimes there were uh, the king of the Holy Roman Empire tried to depose the Pope and oftentimes the popes would excommunicate the kings do you see how it was partly weak and partly strong just like iron and clay don't mix there's so many aspects of this last empire which has spanned the ages since before Christ's advent till now. So the crowns are on the horns. There were kings of these subdivisions of this empire and there were a number. What it came down to was the subdivisions being called the barbarian tribes consisted of um, as I said, there were the Ostrogoths, Vandals, and Huruli. Those were the three subdivision kingdoms that were plucked up by their roots, and they exist no more before the little horn. And you look back in history, you'll see that the Bishop of Rome was appointed Pontifus Maximus by the current Emperor of Constantinople, Justinian. 
just prior to that, three kingdoms before subdivisions, the Huruli, the Vandals, the Ostrogoths, those three had been put down. And just before his taking of the seat of Caesar, it was the Ostrogoths. Besides them were the Anglo-Saxons, England, the Franks, France, the Visigoths, Spain, the Burgundians, Swiss, the Lombards, Italy, the Huns, Hungary, um, the Suevi, and there was, oh, and I'm thinking, wait, Suevi was Germany. I don't have the list in front of me. But you can easily do a Google search and you'll see the 10 kingdoms that made up the Holy Roman Empire. So it says, On his horns were ten royal crowns, but upon his head were slanderous names. The heads of the Holy Roman Empire were the popes. And they had slanderous names even upon their heads, because at one time before they tried to erase this so that all of Christendom would not remember that they are the Antichrist, they had on their crown Vicarious Philly Day, the Vicar of the Son of God. Blasphemous names. The Pope's claim to be God's very representative on this earth. They deny the Father and Son with their doctrines. They put themselves in the place of God. They claim that their priests are your intercessor when there's only one priest and intercessor for any Christian, and that is Yehoshua, Jesus the Christ. So blasphemous, slanderous names on the heads of this beast. Now John says he saw, and it was like a leopard, and its feet like a lion, and his mouth like a bear. And the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. Well, remember back to Daniel 7. Preceding the fourth beast was a beast like a lion, Babylon. There was a beast like a bear. Medo-Persia, there was a beast like a leopard, Greece. The Holy Roman Empire, in its sociology, in its philosophy, and in its religion, typified, in a way, the best and the worst aspects of these previous kingdoms, and especially their religious systems. And we'll see that again when we get to Revelation 17 and 18 and how that manifests itself. So all of these aspects of previous empires it had adopted because it was very much pagan Rome's way to adopt what they saw as the best things about the different religions, philosophies, militaries, and anything else of the kingdoms they conquered. And it says, the dragon gave him his power and his throne and his great authority. Remember, the animal that was used as a representative for pagan Rome was the dragon. The papacy and the Holy Roman Empire Confederate was given its power not only by Papal Rome, but it was also given its power by Satan himself. And that's why in Revelation 12 we see a blending of Satan, 
shown as this fiery red dragon with seven heads, ten horns, but at the same time, it is also a symbolic picture of pagan Rome. So this is so deep and so rich what you can pull away from it, but if you think for some reason that this is a single guy coming in the future called the Antichrist, you're going to be scratching your head and confused from now until then. And you're not going to understand who today is ruling the world, how and why and where it's going. Now in Revelation 13.3 it says, One of his heads seemed to have been slain, but the fatal wound was healed. The whole earth was amazed and followed the beast. Now some people want to say that that fatal head wound was the last kind of emperor, which was a sort of transitional emperor position which didn't last very long, and that that was the fatal head wound. And the healing was Justinian uh, making the papacy Pontifus Maximus. I don't agree with that because the beast that we're looking at right now is the Holy Roman Empire beast. It says, one of its heads seemed like it was wounded unto death, but the fatal wound was healed, and the whole earth was amazed and followed the beast. It seemed like the Holy Roman Empire, typified by the papacy, because the papacy was the head. It wasn't the horns. It started out when it was the Bishop of Rome, as being the little horn that came up from Daniel 7. But now it has encompassed the entire beast. Kind of like leaven. You know how leaven works through the whole lump? This little horn became the power and the heads of this beast. It has the same attributes of the little horn of Daniel 7, and we'll see that. This is one of its heads seemed like it had been fatally wounded unto death. And then that fatal wound was healed, and the whole earth was amazed and followed the beast. It seemed like in the centuries around the time of the Reformation, till what a lot of people point to, as being the end of the 1260 years, which I do not currently believe that. They look at that as being the head wound. In fact, they look at Berthier's army, that's Napoleon's general, Berthier, marching into Rome and taking the Pope captive as the mortal head wound the end of the 1260 years. I don't see that. There, It's possible that that's the head wound that's being talked about, but I do not see that as the end of 1260 years. Because in Daniel 7, it says he made war on the saints for times, time, and a half a time. Now we know that as three and a half years prophetically with a day year principle applied, that becomes 1260 years. The problem you have with this, the problem you have with this is that Daniel 7 says, that it will make war on the saints until the Ancient of Days came. So somewhere in here, we've got some problems with our timelines in eschatology. But we're not going to get too much into that right now. All I'm saying is this. It very much appears to many people like Rome lost, well, let's say the papacy, lost its power. It, it was given a mortal head wound. It seems that way. But that wound was healed, and the world marveled after the beast. Now, some people would point to Mussolini as being the person who restored temporal power to the papacy and the Vatican because now the Vatican 
the Vatican is actually its own country. It's its own church state uh, in its own country. It wasn't that way. The other thing you got to keep in mind is Napoleon's general birth year that marched into Rome wasn't the Vatican, but Rome. There was St. Peter's, and St. Peter's was still in the same place, and that's where the Pope was residing at the time. But what we know today as the Vatican city-state, it wasn't the same then when Berthier marched in in 1798. What you have to remember about that is he was Napoleon's general and he was acting under Napoleon's orders. Napoleon was a Freemason and thus controlled by the Jesuits. The Jesuits did not have to march in Berthier's army to depose the Pope. They could poison him and put their own guy in. The Jesuits had been working at power grabbing for a couple hundred years by now. They had their craft down pretty darn good. At the most, what was happening in the late 17th century, as we count centuries for now, was a ruse. It was a deception. It seemed to have a mortal head wound. So there was the Reformation and I think what had to happen by the late 1790s is it had to seem as though all the power of the Vatican, the Papacy, and the Holy Roman Empire was all collapsing because there had been so many factions and so many countries turning against her. They had to go underground. The Jesuits knew that working from behind the scenes and going underground was extremely effective. And by this time, they were savvy enough to know that it doesn't mean anything if you sit in a throne and have a crown on your head and say, I am somebody, if you're not really the power that's ruling the world. They had already become, to a large extent, the power ruling the world from behind the scenes by this time. So in typical Jesuit fashion, they orchestrated a grand ruse. And part of that was Berthier marching into Rome, taking the Pope captive. Part of that ruse was Ricci, the general of the Jesuits, around, around that time, before then, being imprisoned. Part of that ruse was the Jesuits being uh, a, a papal bull being put out that, that their order was being suppressed. Nonsense. By this time, the Jesuits had far more power than the popes did. Don't, don't think something like that a pope actually had the nerve to go against the Jesuits. Especially the pope who did. He was very much controlled by the Jesuits, and then everybody believed that he was poisoned by them. They believed this ruse. And I think that's what's being described here. The head, the head it seemed like it was slain. And then the fatal wound was healed, and the whole earth was amazed and followed the beast. You should see how the whole world is regarding uh, the Vatican and the Pope. And I mean, people just think uh, going to the Vatican is, is a great uh, pilgrimage. And the way that the crowds mass outside of St. Peter's when, when the Pope is appearing, and the way that people watch in great anticipation when they're picking a new Pope, they watch for the smoke to come out of the chimney. And the world marvels after the beast. They're amazed 
by this beast. And then Revelation 13, 4, And they worshipped the dragon, because he had given authority to the beast. They also worshipped the beast, chanting, Who is like the beast, and who can make war with him? The whole world, whether we want to admit it or not, still operates on Roman law to this day. The laws of England were based on the laws of Rome. In, in my country, the United States of America, we are under admiralty law. Admiralty law is Roman law. Look at our Congress. When you see the speaker, when you see the president give his State of the Union address, notice how on either side of him, up in the air, very large, very predominant is the Roman fasci. The world is still, and not just still, but has become more and more over the last five centuries. Rome. People have believed that the world has somehow gained a great balance from Protestantism, but you don't understand. It has secretly become more and more Roman. This beast is ruling the world from behind the scenes. That is the brilliance of the Jesuits. That has been their modus operandi from the start, and that is how they have fashioned the Roman Empire since. That is why we are going to see it termed in certain ways when we get to Revelation 17 and 18, and it's all going to start making immense sense. So it says they worship the dragon. Our lives in this country, America, and in every other country that is a direct child country of England, every country that is a direct child country of Spain, a direct child country of France, of Holland, of Belgium, of any of those European countries, that were part of the Holy Roman Empire. We all organize and live out our lives acting as citizens of Rome. The whole world worships the dragon. And not only have we all structured our societies and now impose that structure on the whole world? Not only do we conduct our lives and the way we think and the way we act and the way we do, the way our right hand does, the way our forehead or mind thinks after Rome. Not only that, but because we have adopted all of her systems, we also worship the dragon, those whose names were not written in the Lamb's Book of Life, worship the dragon. The dragon not only being pagan Rome, but Satan himself. And many, many people, don't kid yourself, directly worship Satan and absolutely bow to the beast that is typified in the Vatican. I want to encourage you not to be naive about this, because I was naive about this for a very long time. Many people, powerful people, worship Satan, and they bow and answer to Rome. Many of the Roman hierarchy 
directly worship Satan. It is the most evil institution the world has ever known. It is part of the reason, or a great deal of the reason, why their pastors and priests have so many problems with pedophilia and perversions of all kinds. So, then in Revelation 13.5, it says, The beast was given a mouth, uttering great boasts and blasphemies, just like the little horn. It started with the little horn, that little horn with eyes of a man and a mouth, speaking great words and blasphemies. The beast here, Revelation 13.5, the beast was given a mouth, uttering great boasts and blasphemies. That little horn has become this beast. It has consumed the beast. It was given authority to act for 42 months, just like the little horn. This beast, just as the little horn. He opened his mouth with blasphemies against God. Absolutely. Papal bulls, canon law, the Catechism, Vatican I, Vatican II, Council of Trent. He opened his mouth with blasphemies against God. All of their official documents are blasphemies against God. To slander his name and his tabernacle, that is, those dwelling in heaven. Absolutely he does, and not only that, but... Consider the Copernican Revolution. The Copernican Revolution, backed by the Roman Catholic Church and carried throughout the world by Jesuits who were from the early times always the astronomers of any court in the world. They are the ones who have foisted on the whole world, this idea that Yahweh the Father is not seated above the heavens with earth as his footstool on this great plain, this realm that he has created. They have pushed this notion that we're on a ball that's spinning through space, which the word of Yahweh never says anything of the type. They have pushed this lie. He opened his mouth with blasphemies against God to slander his name and his tabernacle. Where is his tabernacle? We see throughout the book of Revelation, his tabernacle is in heaven. There's a heavenly tabernacle. That is those dwelling in heaven. He blasphemes against the heavens. The heavens, the sky, the firmament, is the handiwork of Yahweh. And they blaspheme it by saying it is empty space, when in fact it is a hard, fast boundary that Yahweh himself fashioned, that he sits above him his throne room with his legions of angels, his tabernacle. They blaspheme it. He was also permitted to make war against the Kedoshim, which is the saints, and overcome them. He was given authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation. And that is who they have authority over. The Holy Roman Empire had a great deal of authority in her time. But since the inception of the Jesuits, <clears throat> they have infiltrated and taken over every kingdom of the world. Now, they haven't done it alone. They've had a very special, super powerful agent that has helped actually take over all of these nations and peoples and tongues. And we're going to talk about that entity here soon 
And it says, All who dwell on the earth shall worship him, everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. And worship, worship is the way that you think and the way that you act. People get this idea that everybody is going to uh, get down on their hands and knees and, you know, salami, salami, kind of bowing worship to this Antichrist character when they don't understand that worship is the fact that they will accept this beast's decrees, laws, and doctrines that all go against Yahweh's. Remember that little horn? It shall think to change times and laws. And it has. And the whole world is worshiping that beast by accepting its change of times and laws. It's worshiping that beast. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is meant for captivity, to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be killed by the sword, by the sword he must be killed. Here is the perseverance and faith of the Kedeshim, the saints. And the saints endured much captivity. Many were killed by the sword. And they persevered. The saints, through all of this, yet persevered. And the saints are yet still persevering to this very day. So I challenge any futurist out there, or any preterist, I challenge you to try to make anything other than successive unfolding kingdoms out of the beasts that we see in Revelation based on the visions of Daniel, Daniel 2, Daniel 7. You, you have to do so much finagling, so much mental gymnastics, I kind of hate that term, but I have to use it, with the text to get this. You've got to play around with the text to put the parentheses in Daniel chapter 9, which is not there. Be honest, please. Be sincere. Examine your prophetic model. Does it line up with Scripture? I challenge you to go back Read Daniel 2, Daniel 7, 8, 9, all the way through 12. Read Daniel. Look at the clear definitions of the kingdoms. That little horn. Now, come up to Revelation. Read 12 and 13. And you tell me how you get from a clear picture of of a kingdom over a great period of time to an individual man over a period of a few years. If you're not honest about the symbolism that you're finding in the Bible, in apocalyptic prophetic literature, you're not going to understand why the things in this world are happening. You're not going to understand the deceptions that are taking place in this world. And you're going to be swept away by them. When terrible things happen, you're not going to understand why. And I don't want you to be taken by surprise when things happen that you really didn't think were going to happen. So please. Please re-examine your eschatology. I know I re-examine mine. I'm not still a biblical historicist because I haven't continued to test it and to try it and to burn away the chaff. And I 
am continuing to test it and try it and burn away the chaff. I challenge you to do the same. So next time, we're going to consider the second beast in Revelation 13. And we might get to this definition of the whore and the beast in 17 and 18. Um, I want to try to make this sub-series of circumstantial worldviews no more than three to five parts. I don't know. You know, I don't know where it's going to end up. It's going to end up where it's going to end up. But, you know, I want it to end up at the place of truth. I, I don't want it to end up like, well, this is my preconceived model of eschatology that I haven't tried, that we're not going to question when it doesn't seem to line up, that, which is exactly why when we were going through um, Revelation 13.3 about the head that seemed to have been slain, I had to tell you, well, there's, there's different ideas about when this event happened by different people and I believe in time as more and more saints come to the understanding of the truth about eschatology one or more of you are going to help me better understand these things that's the way it's going to work with us in the Philadelphian church So, that's it for me. Until next time, I always remind you this, because I always have to remind myself this, that Jesus, which is Yahushua, is Lord. Yahweh, God's kingdom, is forever, and I am still your servant. So, farewell.